Okay, good afternoon. So let me uh, remind you what we did last time. For those of you who don't know what LO means. Um, so we looked at a general model for disordered elastic systems. Maybe I can just do that, it's easier. Uh, <coughs> with a so today we're going to be interested mostly in interface. So what I call N last time. So this is going to be a scalar with N equal 1. Uh, <coughs> so we have elastic energy. We have this order coupling to the substrate. And uh, we give ourselves the second cumulant of the random potential, which has this uh, correlator in the direction of the displacement field U, which uh, is supposed to be smooth at some scale. You can write the equation of motion with an applied force F. Now, uh, in this equation of motion, there's also the pinning force, which is a derivative of the random potential. So it's a random pinning force. And its correlator is essentially the same form, but it's the second derivative. This function delta is the correlator of the pinning force. OK, so these correlators can be either short range for random bond disorder, long range for random field disorder, or periodic for random periodic uh, disorder, as we discussed last time. The uh, <coughs> main phenomenology is that if you plot the velocity, if you apply uh, a force, a uniform force, on your uh, elastic interface in this quench uh, disorder, you are going to have a velocity which will be zero up to some threshold Fc. <coughs> and actually, at the critical point Fc, the velocity will grow with some uh, exponent beta. Uh, so there are two critical points in this uh, diagram. Uh, one which is a static, which has a roughness exponent, which I call zeta equilibrium, and then another roughness exponent for the depinning fixed point. So there are two uh, critical points. So we uh, <coughs> then studied this uh, simplified Larkin model, which gave us the physics of what happens at scale below this Larkin length RC. And we found that there was, below this length, there was no metastability. So single minimum locally, elastic response, with this value of the roughness exponent and identification of the upper critical dimension for below which the disorder is relevant. So <coughs> the Larkin of Shinnikov theory uh, predicted the value for the critical force, which is related to the Larkin length in that way. Now, the physics above the Larkin length involves metastability. And today we are going to see avalanches and so on. But in the statics, there are two exponents. There is an energy fluctuation exponent. So this is the variance of the ground state energy, sample to sample. And it grows with some exponent theta, which is related, actually, to the exponent of the roughness. And we found, uh, I uh, <coughs> told you that in uh, one plus one dimension, just a line in one plus one dimension, the directed polymer problem, these exponents are actually known uh, rigorously now even by mathematicians. Uh, <coughs> so, to find these exponents, uh, in general, uh, it's, it's more difficult, but there is this Flory uh, simple argument, which I showed you last time, which, so this F here means Flory. For random field disorder, it predicts 4 minus D over 3, which is actually the exact value which is also obtained by function randomization group. So, it's believed to be exact. However, for the short range disorder, the Flory underestimates the exponent. And the functional RG, which I will briefly mention today again, predicts uh, in an epsilon expansion the value of the short range exponent. And so the story of functional RG starts with Daniel Fisher in 86. In the dynamics, uh, it was Natterman around 1980. And then we have developed it uh, much more. So this is uh, just a table uh, of the prediction from the to loop function RG compared to numerics and to the Flory value. OK, so this was just a reminder. And we are going now to talk about depinning. OK, so let me uh, I'll start there. So we're going to look at this, uh, what happens around here. So how do you actually set up uh, the problem? Well, suppose we are, uh, <coughs> so we're going to look at uh, just a line, elastic line, 
So we're going to have coordinate x and u. And um, usually what people like to do is to put the system on periodic boundary conditions, so on the cylinder, if you want. So essentially, you have some cylinder like this. <coughs> and the, the line will go around the cylinder. It's very schematic here. But. And let me, go, let me look what's happened below the threshold for f smaller than fc. <coughs> and let me, uh, so there will be metastable states. So let me draw one, second one, I don't know. So there will be metastable states, which are, uh, I think there is some shadow, no? No, maybe not. Which are uh, local minima, okay, uh, where the force is zero. So there are zero point force, so it means that this condition uh, equals zero uh, for x at this uh, metastable state. And in addition, there are local minima. And if you start from there, you are, you are stuck there. Uh, you need to increase the force a little bit if you want to get out. Okay? So uh, there is a very important property, which is the Middleton non-crossing uh, theorem or property which is that if you start, or if you consider two elastic lines uh, starting, so the first line we start left on, on of the other one, so the line one left of the line two, then they can never, and they are seeing the same force, the same disorder, then they can never cross. So the reason for that is that suppose they would cross, there would be a time at which they cross, well then they would, um, so this would be line one, which started behind on the, on the left. And suppose there is a time at which they cross. Then at this point here, uh, well, suppose my, my, everything is smooth and so on. At this point, uh, the force, the spinning force is the same on the two lines. The applied force is also the same. But clearly the elastic energy, the curvature, is pushing this line this way and this line. So this, this point, this way, and this point, this way. Okay, so this cannot really happen. So there is no uh, <coughs> possible uh, crossing. And uh, of course, this is valid for interfaces only. It's not valid if you have a line in three dimension or something like this. And uh, it has important consequences. So one of the consequences is that these metastable states, which I, drove, I wrote here, are actually blocking configuration because you cannot cross them uh, because they are stopped. So if you start, I don't know, if you start on the left like this, you will eventually go somewhere. But you cannot cross, you cannot, these are really impenetrable barrier. I mean, you cannot cross them because of this theorem. Okay, so you have to stop either before or on another state, metastable state or at this state. So because of that, so you can think if you want of, in fact, it makes the problem looks a lot like particles. So you can think of particles which would have the same properties, okay? If you just forget the extra dimension. Uh, <coughs> so this would be the metastable states and it would be your, your particle, it would stop here. Okay. So because of this uh, property, uh, Rosso and Kraut in, in 2002 found, uh, invented some very nice uh, algorithms to enumerate actually uh, all the blocking configuration at some value of the force, and then increase the force. And the uh, threshold for a given sample, Fc minus, if you want, in a given sample, is the uh, force at which the last blocking configuration, the last metastable state, disappears. Okay. So they found, uh, because of this property again, an algorithm which allows you to find this uh, configuration in, uh, by just doing one turn of the cylinder. Okay, so you don't have, okay, b before people were just, you know, running the string around the cylinder and seeing how, when it stops and so on, but you just have an algorithm which does one turn, and in one turn, you know exactly what is the last blocking configuration. Um, the reason is that you cannot miss any because you cannot cross them, right? So if you do one turn, you're sure you get them. Okay, so uh, <coughs> this is a nice development, so it allowed to get uh, the uh, deepening exponent with 
uh, quite uh, good precision numerically. Uh, again, the depending exponent will be the roughness of the last blocking configuration, which is defined for uh, a cylinder. Okay, so now if you are uh, above FC, there is some scaling theory of the depending transition. Uh, <coughs> so then if you are above FC, you have motion. So your line is, uh, is moving. And there is some correlation length of the velocity field. Let me call it psi. And uh, this uh, correlation length diverges when you are uh, going towards the threshold from, uh, from above with some exponent nu. So you can introduce, at this critical point, you can introduce a time scale. And then, as I said, the velocity is like f minus fc to the exponent beta. So there is a number of exponents. And there are actually scaling relations between them. So the velocity is also u divided by tau. Uh, u uh, is a displacement. It scales like length to the power roughness exponent. So this is actually xi to the roughness exponent minus z. And uh, yeah, so tau is like xi z. OK, so uh, that implies that beta is actually nu uh, times uh, z minus zeta. So at this stage, you have three independent exponents. And in fact, there is again this statistical tilt symmetry, which I mentioned last time, which comes in, uh, which tells you basically that uh, the elastic force scales like f minus fc, and that there is no uh, correction in between these two terms. So that will give you actually a new equal 1 over 2 minus zeta. OK, so these are the predictions uh, for. Um, so now you have two independent exponents, which usually are taken to be zeta and nu. Uh, zeta, sorry, zeta and z. Or zeta and z. I don't know how you pronounce it. Uh, which are the two independent exponents. So uh, <coughs> in the mean field uh, theory, uh, the value of these exponents are uh, simple. <coughs> so there is a mean field theory which uh, is valid above the upper critical dimension. And then zeta is 0, nu is 1 half, z is 2, and beta is 1. Yeah, all of these are depending exponents. They are different from, uh, from the equilibrium exponent. For instance, this uh, zeta exponent in one dimension, you, you will see later, is 1.2. It's much larger than the uh, two-third exponent. It's actually larger than 1. Uh, OK. So the mean field theory, there was a, a nice uh, paper by Fisher in 85, uh, which uh, solved uh, a fully connected model. Uh, <coughs> however, uh, this fully connected model is, is very nice. It's easy to solve, but uh, it has a slight pathology, which is that uh, it depends. the result depends a lot on the smoothness or not smoothness of the potential and how smooth it is and so on. So the function RG also predicts its exponents. Uh, I would say more from uh, first principle and contains a similar uh, mean field theory, same mean field theory. OK, so this is for the uh, depending transition. And now we're going to move some, uh, some question on the depending. I'm not sure I understand. You're, you're talking about the statistical tilt symmetry? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, like, uh, when we can use this concept and when we cannot use this concept? You can always use the symmetry if the, if the disorder is short range correlated in uh, internal dimension, if it's a delta function. If it's not, if it is some, uh, okay, if there's some correlation length here, which of course in, in reality will always be there, then there are some small corrections, but they are finite corrections, okay? They are going to change the exponents. Okay? So, yeah? Uh, can you repeat again why the no crossing theorem for the two classes? Yeah, so suppose you start in the same environment, same disorder. So this is your initial condition. Uh -huh. So one is really on the left of the other, and they do not cross. Huh? Are, one is on the left. And you run the dynamics. And you ask, you know, can this guy catch? It? So they are moving forward, okay? Can this one catch this one? 
And the answer is no, it's not possible. Except at infinite time, of course, they can converge to each other, but. No, it's just that uh, these metastable states are, are states where, uh, if you start from here, so if this is one and two, then this one will not move because it's a metastable state. So one cannot cross it, okay? Yeah? Long range. Long range and the T was two. Yeah. Would it be that u equals one, z equals one? Yeah, yeah, z would be one in that case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so for long range uh for long range z is one, yeah. Uh new uh pff, okay, I don't remember. <laughs> okay. So conjecture, your conjecture, new is one. Okay, we can discuss it later. I, I must say I don't remember. Uh yeah. No, no, no. This is very complicated. <laughs> this is open. So at the end of the talk, uh, of the lecture, I will give some list of open questions, and this is one. Uh, I mean, there's been some progress on that by Rousseau and so on, but it's, uh, it's really div not a trivial question. Okay, so now we are going to go uh, to Avalanche. So let me, um, let me write again the equation of motion. which we are going to slightly modify uh, to find uh, actually a nicer setting for uh, the statistics of avalanche. <coughs> okay, before, before I do that, let me just uh, remind how these exponents, these critical exponents come out. Uh, if you start doing perturbation theory uh, in this force, and okay, you do it in a, in a right way, which I will explain later, then you, can, uh, you will find that this uh, friction will grow like L to the Z minus two, this will be uncorrected because of this symmetry. This will flow, so the correlator delta of zero will flow. I will show you later. And that will determine, this flow will determine uh, the exponent, the roughness exponent. And this force here, there will be correction, because of this there will be correction to this term, which will be create actually a correction delta f equal minus fc. Okay? So in the functional RG, you can actually um, work out this correction, and you can estimate the critical force, and you get the same as, as Larkin. <coughs> okay. So um, this is the equation of motion, again. And um, it turns out that it's actually better, rather than to write an applied force like this, to, uh, <coughs> to drive it with a, another term, which is this term. Okay, so if you want to study avalanche and you are using this fixed, so this is a fixed force ensemble. Uh, this is uh, a situation, so W of t is a driving function, which usually you can take as V times t, okay? So if you do that, you are, what you are doing is you're actually adding to your um, energy uh, an additional term, which is a, a parabolic uh, term. So it's, uh, you're putting your interface in a, in a parabolic well. So you're adding this to the energy. And you're driving your interface by just moving the center of this well. Uh, I will show how it occurs naturally in experiments, actually. But in a theoretical uh, setting, it is actually extremely convenient to do like this. So why is it? Well, because first of all, I mean, there are many reasons. But first of all, if you... Uh, want to study avalanche, okay, so you're going to be blocked, so then you increase the force, okay, go, and you block, block, block. So at the end of the day, you're going to reach a depending threshold, and you, you see that this procedure is not um, steady state, right? It's not at all, uh, you, you're changing in this procedure the, the distance to the critical point. So what you want to do instead is to drive at fixed velocity, reach a stationary state, and in this stationary state, you can really do statistics of avalanche, okay, and that they will mean something. Uh, you would be always at the same distance from the threshold, basically. Okay, uh, eventually you will take the velocity to be very small, but this is how you're going to do it. So you see that there is the driving force now is m squared uh, times w. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. And the fact that you put a mass is also good for the field theoretical reason because it gives you an infrared cutoff. 
So it means that above a scale 1 over, which is of order 1 over m, just by balancing these two terms, uh, the interface will be flat, okay? So you're killing all the fluctuations at scales larger than this uh, scale. Okay. Now, of course, the limit of interest is a limit where this scale is, uh, is large, so you can do, uh, you can get really a large critical region. So, of course, we're going to be interested in this limit. Okay, good. So, uh, <coughs> now I can show you uh, some slides. So we go back to some experiments. Okay. So we're going to go back first to. Uh, okay. So first, I will give you a list of. Oh. Um, is it, why is this doing this? Um, Okay, so first thing is a list of uh, uh, some kind of uh, reference material. Um, so about Avalanche, there is a very nice uh, review um, where there are a lot of uh, interesting details by uh, one of our students, Dobrinevsky, <coughs> which on, on archive and it's quite useful. Uh, about the ABBM model, which is a mean field model for avalanche, uh, there is this uh, original paper by these four Italian guys, which um, actually were really started from experiments and kind of imagine a model which were fitting very well the experiment. It turns out that they had an incredible uh, foresight because this is really, uh, they guess, the correct uh, theory. I mean, not uh, fully uh, complete, but at least certainly correct. Uh, then there are a uh, modern version of this in this paper, and uh, this Brownian force model, which I'll describe later on beyond the mean field, is uh, this paper. And of course, we have a number of papers where we calculate various things. Okay, so now <coughs> let me go back to uh, yesterday experiment uh, on uh, the contact line of the fluid. So I remind you that you increase the level of the reservoir and the fluid is climbing on some glass plate, which has this order. So it's actually pooled, and in fact, you are exactly in this situation. So you can write an equation of motion uh, which contains uh, overdamped uh, dynamics here. So this is, uh, they have viscous uh, fluid, so it's really overdamped. Now this, I didn't write the correct uh, elastic term. It's a long range term, okay, uh, <coughs> uh, in the experiment in the experimental system. But, but there is this term, there is this driving. And the uh, mass here is, is uh, actually set by the capillary length. Uh, the reason for that is you have a reservoir, and the reservoir has to be flat, uh, the, the fluid has to be flat at infinity, or increasing the level. So this acts as some kind of, uh, of spring, if you want, or uh, of preferred, uh, this is a, there is a preferred position for the contact line because of that, okay? And uh, you can relate this to the uh, capillary length. So this type of uh, driving also occurs in uh, fracture, for instance, in the cracks uh, dynamics, it's called loading. And uh, also in actually in magnetic interface, there are terms like this coming from demagnetization field. But in fact, the OSS, it would be the wrong range, right? Yeah, yeah, in that case, in, in all these cases, actually, okay, this depends, but well, in all these cases, basically, it's long range. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> So what you observe in this experiment, you observe avalanche, which are actually reproducible. If you redo the experiment, you find them at the same place. So it's uh, really related to the disorder. And, um, and you're also at zero, really very low temperature, effective temperature if you want. So you can see here that this is a receding contact line. Okay, so this is dry and this is wet. And the time is, uh, so the time is going like this. So it's going down. The uh, in, uh, contact line is going down, so you see that there are big jumps, like here in blue, which are fast, and then it gets stuck. And you can see it even better if you actually uh, plot the position of the center of mass of the contact line over some length scale. Uh, <coughs> you see, so here it's plotted uh, W, so W can think of it as V times T, okay? Well, it's written here, W is V times T. So V is uh, um, 
is the speed at which you, you uh, increase the level of your, your water, if you want. So it's imposed velocity, average velocity. <coughs> and this is the uh, this difference between the center of the parabola, if you want, and the actual position of the center of mass of the interface. So when, uh, because it's written W minus U of W, it means that when it's going up like this, it means that actually uh, U is, is spin, essentially. And uh, so it's going like proportional to this W, and then it's jumping downward. So, so when U is, is moving forward, brutally, I mean, we, when there is a jump forward of U, then there is this uh, going down here. So these are really these avalanches. And you see that they occur at uh, all scales, actually. Okay, so <coughs> this uh, type of uh, dynamics by avalanche occurs in many systems, of course, and uh, in particular in this Barkhausen noise experiments. In fact, this is uh, this mean field model I mentioned was uh, obtained in the context of the Barkhausen noise. And uh, <coughs> so if you have a, a ferromagnet, soft ferromagnet, uh, you increase the um, uh, varying uh, applied field. The domain wall are going to move forward and they are going to make actually jumps. And when they jump, they will uh, create some electric field which you can pick up in some coil and uh, you can uh, have this. So this is the electric field and the area under this is proportional to the total size, uh, total area of the avalanche. And you can see that they are well separated so that you can really study their statistics. So there are other systems like uh, fracture and peeling. So there are some experiments now in, in, uh, in, uh, in Paris. And uh, there are also uh, interest in, uh, so this is a paper by Zaperi, Santucci, and all people who are doing actually um, more uh, disordered elastic system. Essentially now they are looking at this cell uh, migration. So they also found bursts there and they want to make connections with cracks, propagation of cracks. Okay, so let me now talk a bit about this function RG method. Um, and uh, I will give a kind of a modern uh, view of it, which is uh, following this work that I did in 2006. So the <coughs> idea is very simple. If you uh, phrase it like this, you are going to define a renormalized disorder correlator by this two point function uh, of the position of center of mass of your interface minus the position of this quadratic well. So you are in this setting with this equation of motion. Okay, so W, you can uh, write that it's V times T. You measure this. So for instance, you measure this in this uh, experiment. Okay. And from the two point correlation of this uh, signal, you uh, obtain the renormalized disorder correlator. Of course, it will depend on this parameter m. And the reason why it's uh, defined like this is because this is just, if you put the m on the other side, you see it's just the fluctuation of the force which the spring is acting on the, uh, on, on, on the manifold, on the interface. So it's a renormalized force correlator. And the nice things that you can show is that this definition is equivalent to the one you would get in a field theory which I'm going to write. And uh, as a result, you can show that it obeys a differential equation as you vary the mass. So it depends on this parameter m. And when m goes to zero, you would like that it goes to some kind of fixed point from which you can read off the exponents. And that's what happens. When you uh, vary m, you can write an exact differential equation. So I say exact. Uh, it's exact, but it's an expansion in order. So this is the equation, first few terms. Uh, <coughs> it's an expansion in power of the function. Okay, So if the function is small, of course, it will be uh, a good expansion. And that's what happens actually around four dimensions. The function is going to be at the end small. So this is uh, this flow equation for this object delta. It's actually delta tilde, which should be here. There's also a misprint in this equation if somebody can find it. <coughs> I didn't put it on purpose. I just discovered this morning. <coughs> anyway, so this is an equation for delta tilde of W, uh, which is a rescale version of this thing. Okay, And this exponent zeta is not known, but it will be determined by the fact that this must have some solution which decay at infinity and so on. 
So from this equation, what can you uh, see? Well, you can see, uh, <coughs> if you have good eye and if you correct the misprint, that if you take uh, this, this equation at u, so the argument of the function is, is w, okay, or u, I don't know how you want to call it. If you take it at zero, so the argument of the function is not shown here as a function. Huh? If you take this function at u equals zero, you can see that all these terms actually vanish. Uh, and what you get back is just simply this, uh, this two first term. Okay, and this is uh, a fixed point if, epsil if uh, zeta is epsilon over two, obviously. So that gives you actually Larkin. So if you assume the correlator to be an analytic function, to be smooth function around zero, uh, and taking the, this equation at u equals zero, you immediately recover Larkin theory. So the only reason why Larkin could be wrong is if the function is not analytic at zero. So this was discovered by Daniel Fisher that this, uh, so he wrote this one loop, which is the first uh, line here. <coughs> And he discovered that um, by studying this equation that it develops a cusp at finite scale, meaning that if you start uh, from a function like this, it will, it will become something like this. And this will become like this uh, when the mass becomes smaller than some critical mass, which corresponds, if you translate in terms of scale, to the Larkin length. <coughs> okay. So that's the first thing. And the cusp, which is uh, the derivative here of the function, so I'm plotting uh, delta of u here, <coughs> or delta of w, I don't know how to call it. <coughs> this cusp, actually, uh, as, we, as we showed, is uh, exactly related to the second moment of the avalanche size distribution. So this is an exact relation uh, with the um, definition that I gave you of the renormalized disorder. So you can study this equation, and you find that there are fixed points which are non-analytic, so which have this cusp. Uh, you can calculate this fixed point in order by order in this expansion in epsilon. And from this fixed point, you can calculate observables. For instance, the exponents. So we found that this exponent, roughness exponent, is bigger than epsilon over 3, which was uh, an earlier conjecture by Narayan Fisher. Uh, <coughs> and uh, it's reasonable compared to this, uh, reasonable up to one dimension. This is an expansion of four dimension. It's still reasonable compared to this high precision numerics uh, uh, using this uh, Rousseau and Kraut algorithms. For the long range uh, disorder, it predicts this. And this was found also by in a numerical simulation by Rousseau and Kraut. And in a fracture, after some time, it was finally uh, found that uh, this is actually the correct uh, exponent for the roughness of cracks. Okay, so again, I'm not have time, but this is a numerical simulation to check all these fixed points. You can really check them in numerical simulation, and also in exponent, you can see that there is a cusp. <coughs> okay, uh, so then I will stop here for now, and I will go to some uh, calculations now. Okay. So, <coughs> Maybe no. Okay. Uh, no, I will have to. Well, just at the last minute, so maybe it's better if I just get rid of it now. Okay. So uh, let me now do some calculations. Ah. Okay, so I'm going to study this equation of motion, um, <coughs> the properties of this equation of motion here. So this equation of motion. <coughs> and uh, how you can um, uh, set up correctly the problem for uh, definition of avalanches and calculation of the statistics. Okay, so we'll, it will start again by Middleton. Theorem, which uh, probably is very well known in mathematics. I think there are mathematicians who uh, studied this before, but okay. Uh, <coughs> you can show, it's not, it's not difficult, that um, 
if the driving is forward at all time, so again there is a driving function, and we're going to take this driving function essentially arbitrary, uh, except that uh, it will have to be uh, forward. <coughs> so the derivative is positive in time. So if this uh, is always positive, and if the initial velocity at time t0 is also positive, then it implies that the velocity at all times uh, bigger than t0 is also uh, positive on every point. Okay. <coughs> okay. So that's something you can show. Uh, it's uh, in a line of the Middleton uh, theorem, which I mentioned before. And uh, <coughs> well, you can also uh, show from that the similar argument that um, uh, you cannot have. Uh, okay. So if you don't start with a positive velocity uh, initial configuration. You will have some um, negative velocity from time to time, uh, at the beginning, at the earlier time. But eventually, you will uh, set up in this situation. So eventually, all the velocity will become positive. So there is a memory loss. And uh, what happens is that there is a convergence towards an attractor, which is uh, called the Middleton attractor. So uh, <coughs> if you apply this positive driving, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you will converge eventually towards this Middleton uh, attractor. Okay, so let me explain it a little bit better. Uh, suppose you uh, increase your driving. So, you have, so here, is your, here is your driving, sorry. So let's choose this driving function. So I will increase uh, W, and then I will stop at some value W, which I also call W, sorry, for the notations, but... <coughs> well, then you can show that uh, the configuration of the elastic line will converge when t goes to infinity to a certain configuration, which I call u of x and w, which is uh, the unique leftmost uh, metastable state uh, in in the problem with the uh, quadratic uh, well. So you take your uh, elastic line, you add this quadratic well, okay, and you look at all the metastable states. There will be one on the left, and that's the one to which you converge. And it depends on W, which is uh, this value. Is, is this clear? So to clarify this, let me just make a, a little drawing in, of a particle. It's very simple. The fact that it holds for an arbitrary interface, of course, is, uh, well, for, the, for an interface is a bit less obvious, but let me show it here. No, 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 this is uh, always true for, for this equation of motion. So, property of the equation of motion. Everything is function of m, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, u of, u of w, u of x of w is also a function of m, yes. It's a function of uh, m, the elastic constant, of everything. So let me, let me do it for a particle, because it's much simpler. So for a particle, what do I have? I have uh, this uh, potential. OK, so this, uh, let, me, let me look at the particle. I have this quadratic well, and I have a random potential. OK, <coughs> okay uh, I, I can write. So, so wh what it would like, it would look like something like this. OK, so this guy will always, uh, u square will always win uh, at, at large uh, distance. So you have a parabola, and then you have some uh, uh, random stuff on top of it. And of course, you have here uh, the minimum energy configuration. But you also have here a metastable state, in that case, which uh, we we'll call u uh, minus, maybe I should call it plus. OK, so I put an arrow like this. And this one, I put an arrow like this. So again, this is the this landscape, okay, for fixed given W, uh, and uh, I, I, this is the minimum energy configuration. That's uh, what you would get in the statics. But if you do the pinning, and if you are following this driving, for instance, you will always end up here after some time. So if you start far enough uh, on the left, you will always end up here. So it's easy to see from a little drawing. Let me do the little drawing here. Um, so let me write the equation of motion associated to this. So it's eta u dot 
Okay, I don't have enough space here. Okay, so the equation of motion is eta u dot equal minus v prime of u uh, plus m square uh, w minus u, <coughs> obviously. So I can look at the condition of zero force. Okay, I put this on, on the other side of the equation, so I get that m square w equal m square u minus v prime of u. So I'm going to plot the right-hand side as a function of u. So I will have something like this. And what I need to solve, so this is u, and I need to solve this for a certain w, okay? And then I will increase w, okay? So for a given starting w, I will have, for instance, three solutions. You can have several solutions. Uh, one of them will be the minimum of energy. The other one will be metastable states. But you see that, so this is W. So suppose now I increase W, okay? I increase W. It doesn't matter which one I start from. This will move continuously. And eventually, <coughs> so I'm, I'm in, a, in a situation where I'm, I'm driving the system very slowly, okay? Eventually, this will jump here. And the solution will be here. We we'll jump again here, and so on. Okay. And you see that this solution is always the leftmost one. So whenever there is, so after some initial time, there is a memory loss, and it's always the leftmost one. Okay. So it's W if you want. You, you, to so you want to solve this equation for, you know, different Ws. You're increasing W. And you see that it doesn't matter where you start which metastable state you start, you will always end up... Okay, so for particle, it's trivial. For an interface, it's, of course, less trivial, but it's true, okay? It happens the same way because of this Middleton uh, properties. Okay, so now uh, <coughs> we want to define the center of mass of the interface as a function of this W, which is position of the, of the well. And, you know, again, you can think of W to be V times T. Hmm? It's the simplest, uh, simplest uh, driving possibility. And we are going to be interested in the limit where V is, is very small. So it's called quasi-static driving. <coughs> so how do I see this U of W in the limit of quasi-static driving, uh, which would be the leftmost, uh, so this, this attractor? Well, I just take the Vitesse velocity to be very small, so it's, quasi, it's called quasi-static. And what I plot is I plot u, position of center of mass, as a function not of t but vt. Okay, and then it will converge when v goes to zero to some kind of staircase, like this. <coughs> okay, and this will be the metastable states. U of w1, u of w2, and so on. Okay, said differently, you can start from one of these uh, metastable states. You can increase W, so at first nothing will happen because there is a barrier here. So if you increase W, nothing will happen. At some point, there will be a more favorable state, so you will jump to another one at some other value, W prime and W prime, and the area here is. Uh, avalanche size. <coughs> so the avalanche are simply the motion from one Middleton state to another one, okay, on the attractor. And if the disorder is smooth, it will occur for a discrete set of W. So I'm supposing, of course, that I am a finite system. If I have an infinite system, of course, I will have uh, too many of them, but uh, and the, the uh, <coughs> avalanche size is simply defined like this, where U is the center of mass of the interface. Okay, so <coughs> now this is the definition of, of the avalanche. Now what about the protocol to do statistics on them? Well, <coughs> there are two ones, which I can mention. The first one 
is just to drive at fixed velocity. So then you are going to reach a steady state, and the Middleton theorem actually shows that it's a unique one. And you plot uh, u dot, so the local, uh, the instantaneous velocity at time t, and you plot it of the center of mass, let's say, as a function of vt. And as I showed you in this experiment, you are going to have kind of peaks like this, and when v going to be smaller and smaller, these peaks will be more and more sharp, and the avalanche will be well separated. So when v goes to zero plus, the avalanche are well separated if your system is, is finite at least. Okay, <coughs> so that's number one. Number two, uh, what you can do is a kick. So you can start, so number two is a kick, avalanche following a kick, this was actually developed a lot by our student, uh, Alexander Brinevsky. <coughs> he liked this kick a lot. And it turns out to be quite a useful idea. So uh, you take a driving function which is uh, zero, and then which jumps to value w, which means that uh, the time derivative of w is delta function at time zero, let's say. So you prepare your elastic line in a Middleton state at time zero. You can do that by driving it from minus infinity and stopping the driving at zero. And then you apply this kick and you can draw the velocity, instantaneous velocity, as a function of time, and it will be will start actually exactly at w, uh, t is zero plus, and then it will have some. Okay, so there will be some avalanche, sometimes small ones, sometimes big ones. We are going to calculate this later, but uh, it will have, they will have duration t. I will show later that this duration can be defined in the mean field models, and actually in, a, in some scaling sense it can be defined. But okay. So uh, the total area of this curve will be the total avalanche size. And uh, you can, with this procedure, you can define very clearly what is the probability of observing a size S uh, for a driving W, for a kick W. And for small kick, it will actually go to W times a function rho of s, which is actually a density, it's an avalanche density. And this density of avalanche in the limit w going to zero will be exactly what you observe here. Okay, so these two pro protocols are different for finite w, but when the w goes to zero, they give exactly the same uh, statistics. So if you want, this is kind of a zoom statistically of what happens in this steady state driving. Okay, so we have defined very carefully, and it's important actually, I want to stress it, because you go, there are a lot of experiments, a lot of data on avalanche, but if you don't define very clearly what is, uh, you know, what you are actually, what is the statistical ensemble that you are looking at, uh, you can say uh, nonsense. So this is a, a clear definition, and what you will observe is that this density of avalanche usually have power law exponents, so there is exponent tau, the size, there will be some exponent alpha, let's say, for the duration, and there will be also an exponent for the velocity inside the avalanche, which we can call A, okay, and uh, you can define many, many more, you can define local exponents, you can define all kinds of exponents. Uh, I want to stress one thing, so it's actually, uh, I'm asking you, if I have smooth motion, and if I calculate the moments of the velocity, so I'm driving a system at some velocity v, which is small, let's say, but finite. If the motion is smooth, clearly, this will be like v to the p, right? If you have avalanche, what will be this? So this is a, a way, if you do calculation, in fact, this is how we derive the... Uh, first time the avalanche distribution is by calculating these moments. But for this, you need to see the avalanche, and 
The signature is what? So here is there are like v to the p when v is small, right? And here. Hmm? Yeah, I don't want details. Just very simple. It's intermittent motion, intermittent motion, intermittent behavior. Either it doesn't occur, either u dot is zero, or rarely sometimes u dot is not zero, and then it's over the one. So in an avalanche, u dot is over the one. Completely a different scale, it has nothing to do with v, okay? So with some probability, which is small, u dot is over the one, and the rest of the time u dot is zero. Now this probability is proportional to v itself, so this is actually proportional to v, okay? And what's in front will give you moments of the avalanche uh, velocity in that case inside the avalanche, okay? But the behavior will be this. And this is the mark of intermittent motion. Well, the reason for that is simple, okay? If you have, uh, I told you that this, they will occur at discrete uh, set of W1, W2, and so on. So there is some fixed density of avalanche per unit W. W, again, is the position of the well, okay? So the NDW is over the one, let's say. It's some, something you can calculate, but it's not, it's not doesn't have to be small. If you divide now by uh, dt, then you get something which is over the v, okay? So it means that on the time axis, the density of these points, if you, if you have time instead of w, is very small, okay? So that's why these events occur with a probability proportional to v, okay? This is true for arbitrary intermittent motion. It just happens uh, to be quite useful here. Okay, so now I'm going to... So are there some questions? Yes? Sorry? This one? We're going to calculate it now. It's a letter A. Sorry, I should call it... Uh, we didn't know actually how this expand was called, uh, you know, so to call it A, I don't know. Yeah, so you, you just, you, you have the avalanche, and you choose at random a, point, a time in there, and you look at U dot, and you do statistics on that. Okay? Inside the avalanche, huh? condition to the fact that it's not zero. Okay? Okay, so let me now to... Yeah, we did by part. This is a f no a no tau. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you have to resum things. So, okay, I will show you one calculation now, which is not the method we used at the beginning, but this is another method. And uh, okay. I cannot. There's another one below, right? Ah, fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to uh, tell you a bit about the mean field theory of avalanches. And by mean field theory, I mean it will be the theory which describes the statistics of the velocity field inside one avalanche uh, in the quasi-static limit. And it is not a mean field theory of deepening transition, it's a mean field theory of avalanche. <coughs> okay, so I will write this equation. I will write the equation of motion which is there, but I will take a derivative with respect to time. So we're going to go to the, not the position theory, but the velocity theory. I'm going to look at how the velocity evolves. So here I have W dot. <coughs> so again, uh, this, this symbol and this symbol is the same. Huh? It's just that I like to write it like this. And then I have the derivative of the force and of t. So you notice that I've got, got rid of the space, okay? Uh, you can do exactly what I'm doing. You're going, it's absolutely possible to do it also for uh, u of xt. I'm not going to do it because it's a little bit more cumbersome notations, but it's the uh, same thing. And the other thing is that, so in, you can think of it as a particle if you want, but it turns out that if you do it for this field and you look at the center of mass, you're going to get exactly the same thing, okay? 
So that's a property of this uh, theory. So, so at this stage, it's an exact equation, and I uh, haven't done anything. So let me let me repeat it. So first of all, I can do it for u of x t the same way. Second, uh, if I define the total uh, velocity to be the integral of u of x t and the total driving to be the integral of the driving, so L d times W of t, then in this uh, theory where I keep track of x, of space, then this quantity will follow exactly the equation. Not this equation, but the one I will obtain later. So there's dots here, Yeah, there are dots, yes. So let me just do it for a, a, a point, just to make things a bit simpler. So now I cannot resist. Uh, so I, I gave you a little bit of replica. I cannot resist to give you a little bit of uh, Martin C. Jarrow's dynamical action. So let me write it here. Uh, I'm sure Leticia told you that you can um, calculate, when you have such equation of motion, you can calculate averages of observable by writing uh, Writing the delta, fun writing the equation of motion as a delta function. So here it's dtu dot minus. I will not write it, okay? And then you can average some observable, okay? So this delta function, you can exponentiate it into by adding an additional response field. So here this response field is conjugated to the velocity and you can write it so it's just a rewriting of a delta function. Um, and here I just put the equation of motion, okay? So I haven't done anything. And here I still have this observable which I can add here, okay? Okay, so now this I'm going to average over this order. So this will produce here some action S. Okay, and this action will be the sum of two parts, one which is just this part corresponding to this equation of motion without disorder. So let me write it. So I'm going to do this thing a little bit in detail, not too much, but because it's a rather pretty uh, calculation actually. Okay, so this is the first part. So I'm still missing some dots. And then uh, the disorder part, where you can see that what you have to do is you have to average uh, things like this. Over this random function, which is Gaussian. So you will end up with a disorder part. So the action is the sum, uh, is the sum of the two. And the disorder part will have this um, form. So, as always in this dynamics of disordered system, the action of the disorder term is non local in time because it's quenched disorder, it doesn't change with time. And that is usually quite nasty. We're going to see that here there is a very nice property <coughs> which makes it simpler. So, Everybody agrees with this? So delta of u, if I'm naive, I would take the original correlator of the force, okay? So this, this thing, delta zero. But I'm not going to do that, because I'm not naive. <laughs> so we, so it's, it's actually correct. You can justify all of this with the field theory uh, construction correctly, okay? So what I'm, but before I do that, let me just give me one, okay. I will come to this. Okay, so let me first take a first derivative. That's not too difficult. So uh, if I take a first derivative, I have a velocity coming out, okay? But I still have a derivative acting on this horrible term, okay? Bon. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, and then it's a derivative of this term. Now this, I'm going to use the uh, renormalized delta. And we know that this guy actually as a cusp, okay? So it starts like this. <coughs> so 
So that will correspond, if you want, to a model which has rough disorder. Okay? But even, okay, you can justify that at large scale this is the correct thing to do and so on. I don't want to get into that, but, okay, and sigma is a delta prime uh, of zero plus. Okay, so if you allow me to do that, then I will show you that the problem is very simple. Uh, it turns out that these terms, you can start including them, the high order terms, but they are going to come only in the high order and the epsilon expansion. Okay, so uh, <coughs> to lowest order, which will be mean field theory, you can neglect them and then you can include them, and that's what we did, of course, later. But here I'm going to just neglect this high order term. So I'm going to say that this is a disorder. And I'm going to go on. So then uh, this delta prime, I can just replace it by delta prime of zero um, time. So this becomes u dot t uh, delta prime of zero plus, which is this famous cusp, uh, times dt prime of the sine of ut minus ut prime. Okay. So I still have something nasty, because there is a field coming on here. But now I remember Middleton theorem. Middleton theorem tells me that I can actually restrict and I can replace to a forward moving configuration, and I can replace this by the sign. If I replace this by the sign, then it's very nice, because what you get here is a delta function. So what you get is actually Something now which is not anymore non-local in time, okay, is this theory. And I'm going to write plus order epsilon because if you do expansion in epsilon, you have higher order terms, okay. So you get this. And now what is very nice about this is that if you look at it, uh, the action is linear in u dot. So you can integrate out u dot. So then you can show the following. Um, okay, I'm going to need space. Yeah. yeah. So when you said you're naive, meaning that you're keeping, you're not evaluating a zero, but you're evaluating a zero plus. Well, no. I mean, I, I, I'm, which part is not naive? What's not naive is to write to to choose this. So I'm doing it by because I'm a theorist. I know randomization group. I do that. Remarkably, these guys, these four Italian guys, 1990, they were looking at their experiments, and they did exactly the same. I mean, not in this language, but what they did is exactly the same. So what they did is they say, okay, I'm going to, I don't know how to write a model for an interface, okay, it's complicated. So I'm just going to write, a, take a point, replace the point, the interface by a point, and try to fit my experiments. But they discovered that you cannot do it with short range disorder. You have to put some random, some, uh, force landscape, which is a Brownian motion. Okay, so this is the correlator of a force, which is Brownian motion. Okay, so the force f of uh, f of u, which has this correlator, is a Brownian motion in u. So they had this intuition, and then they could see their experiments. Okay, so this is uh, the ABBM model, and that's a kind of a field theoretical way to to show how it arises from first principle, if you want, in this problem. Do you see a theory consist in saying the smooth part of the randomness is just irrelevant? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, uh, it will correct only uh, short scales, yes. If you rescale everything with the proper powers of the mass, then it will disappear. Okay, I don't know where to write. Is there some other? No. Okay. Ah, yes. Okay, great. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, I just took the derivative respect to time of this equation. So this is our damped equation of motion. You take a derivative respect to time. Okay, so you put dots everywhere if you want. So I put a dot here, dot here, then I take derivative respect to time of this, and then I have a dot here, and so on. Okay? Okay, so 
the reason why I wanted to do it like this, okay, so let me, so it's a long story, but let me, okay, so let me finish this, this calculation. So what this calculation uh, allows you to, to do is to write an exact expression for any such observable. Okay, so there are averages over this order of this. For arbitrary driving function W of t. So lambda of t is an arbitrary function. W of t is an arbitrary function. Um, <coughs> so let me write here how it comes. Well, let me just say it in words. Okay, so you have this. Yes? Uh, sorry, sorry, it's positive. I mean, it's forward. It's always growing. I mean, it's, okay. yeah, yeah. I'm always in that situation. We don't know how to do it, the other case. I mean, it's, if you do the other case, you have these problems here. You don't know what to do with this. You could have zeros of this function for very distant times. You are completely dead. Okay, so we, we try, I mean, Lebrinevsky tried a lot, this, and he got some, some stuff, but it's really difficult. So it's always positive. Okay, so W dot is positive. In this equation, the noise you know is like a White noise. Yeah, well, yeah. By yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a nice model. I will, I will here give the, the version of a, a BBM maybe here. But let, let me write this uh, kind of very nice. Uh, first, let, let me finish this calculation. So I put this observable here, okay? Uh, so it will just, you know, it's in the exponential. We just add to the action, okay? So it's again a, a term linear in u dot. The action is linear in u dot, u dot here. A new dot here, okay? So I can use, I can integrate over u dot, and it gives you a delta function of something, okay? So at the end of the day, it's very, I mean, it's really two lines, but I'm going to write them because too much stuff on the blackboard. Uh, the, 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 the statement is this. This is equal to exponential of m square integral over time u tilde t w dot t. So this is the only term which didn't contain u dot, so it, it remains there. And what is u dot t? Well, there's this delta function constraint when I integrate over u dot. And it gives me a nonlinear uh, differential equation for u tilde. So <coughs> u tilde will satisfy this nonlinear equation. Okay, so the statement is the following. You can calculate any observable, the average of a disorder of any observable containing the velocity in that form with arbitrary function lambda of t for arbitrary driving. If you know how to solve this equation, so it's a nonlinear equation, it's not too, too, too difficult. I mean, it's not, there are worse equations than life. Uh, so you can choose any source. We're going to play that game later. You can choose some, some sources. You solve the equation, you plug it there. So I could call it u tilde lambda as a solution. So u tilde lambda is solution of this nonlinear equation. When there are some boundary conditions, it has to vanish at infinity if, uh, if lambda vanishes at infinity. Is it minus m squared? Plus, plus infinity. Plus m squared. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's minus. It's a reverse sign. So this was plus. You do integration by part here to derive it. Okay. Okay, so we call this instanton equation. It's probably not a very good name, but uh, like this, you can. So, is it clear? Okay, so this is one way of solving this mean field model. Let me just indicate uh, the ABBM original model for one particle. Um, <coughs> so, if you say that this is Brownian motion in U, so then <coughs> if you write it as a function of U, take the derivative as a function of U, then it's white noise in U. So you can rewrite this equation like this. Now this is white noise in U. So you write U dot as a function not of time but of U. And you can do it because it's monotonous again. You get this equation. Now it's a simple Langevin equation. Everybody here knows how to uh, solve it. And this is what was written originally by ABBM. For instance, you can calculate immediately the stationary uh, distribution of the velocity. 
and you find this. So there is, as you said, a time change, so you have to correct for it and so on. I'm not going to give all the details, but you get an exponent for the velocity, which is 1 minus m squared v over sigma. Just by looking at the stationary solution of the associated focke planck equation, Laetitia has done a lot of stuff like this. I'm not going to do it here. You can look in the papers. There is a nice interpretation of this, which uh, I'm sure any mathematician see immediately, which is that this is the Bessel process in the limit where m goes to zero, which means that uh, u dot can be seen also as the radius r of Brownian motion in, uh, in d dimension, d tilde dimension, uh, d tilde being 1 plus m square v over sigma. So if you write the uh, Langevin equation for the radius of the Brownian motion in d dimension, you find this equation without uh, this term, okay? So it will give you correctly what happens at small u dot, okay? So when you have, um, which is this divergence here. It will not tell you this, but we give you this power. Okay, so <coughs> so this is one way to. Uh, v here is so v is the driving velocity. So it's like w dot divided by u dot or something? Or uh, yes. Mm -hmm. No, no, sorry, so no. Uh, yeah, it's w dot, d w dot is v in this. Okay, yeah, thank you for the... Yeah. So here w of t is arbitrary, forward. Here, you can really do this nice stuff, I mean, all this mapping, I mean, probably you can extend it, but it was done only when w is vt. Okay, so when w is vt, you can write things like this, and then you can map it to a uh, motion in some strange dimension or you can directly solve the focke planck equation. Okay, so I'm going to, yeah, so some questions? So I'm going to try to finish uh, by uh, showing a calculation of the avalanche size distribution using this uh, method here. Um, so maybe I'll do it he here. Um, Sorry? Yeah, so, so since we are interested in the limit of uh, zero plus velocity, quasi-static avalanche, uh, A is one. Okay, so let me look at the total size uh, distribution. So the size of an avalanche, as we have seen, Yeah, absolutely. It's an absorbing. Yeah, so it's it's actually an absorbing boundary condition. Yeah, so it gets to zero, then it waits a long time, and then it starts again and gets to zero and so on. It doesn't describe. This doesn't describe what happens between the avalanche. It just describes the. <coughs> okay, so total size distribution. I want to do the look at the probability of this. So you see, I can use this formula by just taking lambda of t constant. And I should have been a bit more careful here. I'm going to take a, a kick, or let's say I'm going to take a driving force, a driving function which starts, you know, I start in the middle of the state at time zero, and then I apply arbitrary driving function. This is the most correct way of doing it. And um, so then you see that exponential of lambda s will be simply um, exponential of m square. Okay, so you have to look at this equation with a constant lambda. So clearly it means that uh, lambda is time independent. U tilde will be also time independent. So the equation will be just a quadratic equation. <coughs> okay, so the solution is just uh, very simple. Okay, so then by this uh, theorem here, I can say that, uh, uh, so W dot, is going to be, so I'm going to look at an avalanche following a kick. Okay, so I have a kick, so W dot of T is delta of T. Again, I prepare my elastic uh, 
object in a Middleton state, I do a kick at time uh, zero proportional to W, and I calculate the size distribution of size of the avalanche which follows this kick. Okay, so here I have essentially the integral of W dot is one, so I have just W times U tilde. Uh, sorry, u tilde at time zero, sorry. Uh, because it's a, it's a delta function at time zero, so it's the this thing at time zero. But it, here it doesn't matter because it's a it's a constant. Okay, so it doesn't matter. <coughs> okay, so uh, <coughs> so you see that it's uh, you, what you have to do is to have to invert. Uh, so I'm going to go to dimensionless units. So I'm going to get rid of all these factors m. So there is a, a scale of uh, a cutoff scale of uh, the avalanche, which is called SM. Well, it turns out that it's also equal to this. And then there is a, <coughs> a time scale, which is eta over m square. So this gives you the scale of the motion inside the avalanche. Okay, so typical, or well not the typical size. Uh, is actually a maximal kind of cutoff size. It, it gives you the size of the large avalanche, as I will show and the time scale associated to them in this mean field model. Okay, so if you do that, then what you have to do, well, this is a Laplace transform, double-sided if you want, but actually since the uh, motion is forward, S is positive, and then, okay, so this, this is equal to this, and I want to invert Laplace. So this is a function of lambda, which is written here. Okay, and if I do the uh, inversion of Laplace of exponential, so this is exponential, W over 2, 1 minus 1 minus 4 lambda, and if you do that, uh, inverse Laplace transform, Mathematica does it extremely well for you, you get this very simple result. So you get a distribution which is uh, perfectly uh, normalized to 1, and it's not pathological at all. The average of S is W itself, okay? So it's fixed by the size of the kick. But uh, in the limit where W goes to, becomes very small, you see that this becomes proportional to W times something which is the density. And this density of avalanche per unit W, they are like S3 half exponential minus s over 4. So that's the avalanche density. So the exponent tau of the avalanche is 3 half in the mean field model. So again, the, the value for a was 1, and for the avalanche size is 3 half. This looks like a yeah, yeah. Of the duration of an experiment. Absolutely, no. Yeah, yeah. All of these things are really, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, this is, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So return to the origin of the Bessel so process. The first yeah. pass huh? But I like to do it like this because here you can do it for arbitrary driving, so. So, for instance, it allows you to see what happens if you keep W small but finite. So this is not normalizable, right? This has a divergence S to the 3 half, and this is often the case, I mean, this is almost always the case, actually, for uh, density of avalanche size. Uh, because in general there is a small scale cutoff and there is a large scale cutoff. The large scale cutoff is SM because everything here is units of, I put everything in units of SM, this is S over SM. But there is also small scale cutoff and uh, the only small scale cutoff here is actually uh, this kick size. So if you look at the distribution a bit more carefully, you can see uh, relatively easily that there is a cutoff uh, for S going to zero, which is W square over S. So it means that uh, most of the avalanche following a kick will be very small for small w, huh? will be over the w square. Most of them will be very small avalanche. But sometimes there will be some rare ones which will have a density rho of s times probability which is of order. But this will occur with probability which is of order w. Okay, so this is uh, there is a separation, complete separation of of scales, okay? So that's that's what happens in avalanche. Okay, so questions? What happens if you take the W goes to zero limit in the row of S? 
Yeah? If I take W to zero here, I get something very singular because there is a piece. Again, there is a, there is a lot. All of the weight is. I can make maybe a drawing. Um, it's not that easy to draw, but all the weight is around W square. Okay. But then there is a tail here. This tail is one over S three half. Okay, and then there is a, a much larger cutoff, which is S M here. Okay, so, so there is a small scale cutoff which is given by the driving, uh, the kick itself, the size of the kick. Okay? So if W goes to zero, these scales become more and more uh, separated. And it becomes more and more relevant to have a, a, a big avalanche. Okay? Uh, nevertheless, they have to occur because on average, S should be W. So their contribution to total displacement is very important. So it's extremely intermittent motion, okay? So I don't have much more time, so I will just give a, I'm not, I wanted to do the calculation of the duration distribution. Uh, I'm not going to do it, it's uh, not enough time, but I will uh, just give you now the results, simply the results for this. So you can, you can do it exactly the same way by um, choosing a driving fun uh, a function, a source function like this. So you solve the equation, uh, you get something like this. You, get, you solve this nonlinear equation, it's very simple actually in that case. <coughs> and from this, you can uh, get exponential lambda u dot of t0, uh, just exponential of this. You take lambda to infinity, uh, meaning that do minus infinity. You see it has a limit. And that will select. So it will be non zero. It will be either zero, if u dot is positive, or if u dot is zero, which means the avalanche has finished, then it will be one. Okay, so it gives you exactly the probability uh, in the limit, in this limit, that the duration is smaller than t zero. Okay, so that's how you get the duration distribution. And what you get as a result that you get is, uh, let me just write it here. Okay, I'm going to just write it for W small. There's an expression for arbitrary W, but, and it's like 1 over T square, which means that the exponent alpha in this field is 2. <coughs> okay. So there are a number of other things you can calculate in infield. I wanted to show you the agreement with the experiment. I'm not sure I'll have time. Okay. Um, you can calculate the average size at fixed duration, which goes from um, quadratic to linear uh, behavior, which is actually seen nicely in the experiment. <coughs> so T here is units in, uh, in these units of time. Uh, and and in another interesting thing is the shape of an avalanche. Okay, so the shape of an avalanche is the velocity inside an avalanche for fixed duration. So you plot the velocity, not as function of time, but time divided by the duration of the avalanche. So you normalize time by the duration of the avalanche, and you want to know when it was moving, at what velocity, and so on. And you can see, you can with this simple calculation uh, method, you find that it's just a parabola in the mean field theory. So the avalanche starts and then stops, like this. Uh, so these are for small avalanche which are in the regime, in the power law regime. And the avalanche which are large, which are of the order of the cutoff, they will be much more like this. Okay, so they will be some kind of steady state. They are symmetric in mean field. They are not symmetric outside of mean field. Actually, it's interesting. Um, so there will be some kind of steady state which will establish and a fixed velocity, and eventually the avalanche will die. So this will be for t much bigger than 1. Okay, so uh, let me... Oh, yeah, so this is uh, the avalanche, the shape. So this is called shape of an avalanche at fixed duration. At fixed duration. You can also look at the shape at fixed size. So 
you ask, you look only at avalanche of a given size S, and you ask what is U dot of T average for this avalanche of size S. And then you find this in mean fields, very simple result. And this we have actually uh, very nicely fit in uh, experiments on uh, Barkhausen noise. So this is mean field predictions. And if you go now beyond, so questions about mean field? Yeah, so it's a shape at fixed size. So here you are looking at uh, it's a 2t exponential minus t square over s. Okay, so I should write in the center. Okay, so a last, uh, can I get this guy? Yes. Last uh, word about beyond mean field. So there's some more question on mean field. So beyond mean field, let me just give some results. So what you can do is uh, you can go back and add these terms which I neglected, okay, and do this calculation. Um, so what you find, first of all, you find so the first of all there is a conjecture, which uh, is uh, also. Uh, an Ariane Fisher conjecture, but this one is actually correct, probably, uh, which is that the avalanche exponent is related to the roughness exponent by this relation. Okay, so you can get to this type of relation if you assume that there is some kind of limit where m goes to zero, and when the density per unit force of avalanche doesn't have any singularity in that limit. That implies this. And in fact, this is what we found also in the field theory, although we checked it only to lowest order in epsilon. So the exponent alpha is also related to the exponent uh, by some scaling relation. So this one is not a conjecture. I think this one is quite solid. Which one is alpha? So again, zeta. So alpha is a duration exponent. Um, Zeta is the roughness exponent at depinning, and Z is the dynamical exponent at depinning. And the velocity exponent, so we kind of extended the Narian Fisher conjecture, and we proposed uh, this relation for the velocity exponent, which we checked was correct to order epsilon, first order in epsilon. And uh, after a lot of effort, actually, uh, Alexander Colton did numerical simulation and uh, in one dimension, which I agree with it. I say a lot of effort because you have to really go to very large size to, to see it. Okay, and then uh, w there are a lot of results on shapes, universal shapes. So this parabola is now changed into some non-symmetric shape. Uh, and uh, experiments are trying to uh, actually um, see this. Z is a dynamical exponent. So there are two exponents for the dipping transition, zeta and z. And it seems that these uh, avalanche exponents are related to these two exponents. But it's still at the level of the conjecture, I would say, but uh, it's what is believed. Okay, so now uh, I have maybe five minutes to write open problems in this uh, thing. Where did you get the dash exponent from this exponent? The what? No, 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 there is no theta exponent here. This is, uh, yeah. alors, yeah. let me, uh, this is part of the... Actually, this is. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. Okay. So let me let me make a short, short list. I mean, it's not short actually. It's a long list of uh, open question. Uh, okay, let me just do it. Okay, so I've told you a lot of things about disordered elastic systems, and I told you things we understand. But of course, there are also things we don't understand, and uh, that's why I think it's still. In exciting subject. So let me just tell uh, a few uh, of them. <coughs> okay. Um, first of all, for long range elasticity, so there are some type of question which remains within the range of disordered elastic systems without modification necessarily of the theory. Uh, 
<coughs> long range elasticity will produce avalanche which are non-local. So uh, a piece of the elastic interface is moving, but it will produce by long range interaction motion everywhere, or could be very far. So the avalanche will be kind of disconnected. So there will be an avalanche that's not connected, but there will be pieces moving like this. And there are even clusters, cluster structure with fractal exponent, and this is not really uh, understood, okay? Uh, there's no good uh, theoretical description, I would say. I showed you a quasi-static limit because that's where we know exactly w w what to do. But at finite velocity, so velocity being small, it is question also of return to the origin that Gerard mentioned. If the velocity d goes beyond a certain threshold, then the uh, interface will never stop. Okay, so there will be some, you can see it actually here, if you reach a dimension two, you, n you don't come back to the origin, which means that you have infinite avalanche. If you are, if so, if the velocity is large enough. So in the mean field model, it's predicting this phenomenology, but we don't know if this is correct in finite v. We don't know if the tau exponent depends on v or not uh, in finite dimension beyond mean field, oh, beyond this model. Yes. Okay. Uh, another interesting thing are thermal rounding. So I told you that there is creep. Uh, but if you are near the depending transition, and it's related to a question that Leo asked, the velocity is not zero at finite temperature, but at low temperature, but it grows at like some power of temperature. And it's not, there are actually experiments right now uh, in Orsay by Vincent Jeudy on uh, this, and it's not completely understood what happens. Another thing is uh, the dynamics of creep. So, once, uh, I didn't have time to tell you, but you have to go over barriers. But after you go over barriers, you go downhill, okay? And you still have smaller barriers. So there's, an, in numerical simulation, you see very nicely that there are actually avalanches uh, in the creep phenomenon, and they are very correlated. I mean, the one at the beginning are not too correlated, but the one in the, in the creep seem to be very correlated. If you uh, have an avalanche somewhere, you have another one very close and so on. So uh, there's a lot of activity now trying to understand this creep avalanche. You're going too fast. Just uh, right now, I'm in. A, um, I'm just in elastic manifold, same model, but we don't even understand some some of the consequences of the model. I will go next to some next more uh, deeper question. Okay, so again, uh, within this model, if you go beyond interface, so you take your line in three dimension, or you take a vortex lattice, the depending theory is not really really well understood. Uh, and I can talk to some people if you are interested, but okay. And the avalanche are even less understood. There is not even a mean field theory for the avalanche in that case. Uh, we tried to write one with, uh, to do one with Kai Visa. We, we actually failed. So we don't know how to do. And the problem, of course, is because in that case, the Middleton theorem fails. So it's more difficult. So, so Middleton fails in that case for uh, object which have more uh, components. Okay. So now let me go beyond uh, disordered elastic systems. And as was mentioned by uh, Bulbul, uh, there are many systems in nature, uh, earthquakes or brain avalanche, avalanche in the brain or many, many systems where there are strong time correlation and aftershocks. And uh, I think it's fair to say that this uh, phenomenology is not included in the disordered elastic system. You'd have to kind of couple it to uh, some other things, or you have to put some retardation effects. So, okay, some people are working in that direction. So this is not really understood how to have a, really a, a real theory of that. Uh, something else which is, of course, very important for this conference are plastic yielding. So uh, this is important for, gran for when you share granular material or uh, dislocated solids. Then you have a transition where the, um, if the shear is large enough, if the, uh, then you have a, a flow. And uh, okay, there is a lot of activity in that domain, as you know. Uh, there are automata models. There is a, a scaling theory which was proposed by uh, Rosso and, and Viard, Mathieu Viard, um, which actually 
looks somewhat like the deepening transition at, for the manifold, for the elastic interface, but the, what replaces U is actually the strain. And the difficulty is that the elastic interaction now are given by this HLB kernel, which, um, never remember if it's Y, yes, Y. HLB kernel, which is not monotonous, so it can change sign, and in particular, if you move something forward, it can, you know, in Middleton theorem, if you move something forward, it will always destabilize the other uh, part of the interface. But in that case, it can actually stabilize it. So, okay, there's a lot of activity, and the uh, question of similarity and difference with depending are still quite open. And I want just to terminate on a positive note, which is that um, there are also connection with SunPine models, which uh, were introduced long time ago, actually, to model uh, self-organized criticality. And uh, it has been suspected for some time that some of them are actually the same class as the interface. And we have actually shown with uh, Kai Visa that the stochastic uh, MANA class of, uh, of SunPile is actually identical uh, to uh, interface. The so there, there is a mapping which is a little bit like the call of mapping. I mean, it's some kind of trans change of variable which allows you to go from one to the other. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm done.